The Gonzaga Bulldogs sent a message not only to LMU, but to the entire NCAA. When they are on, they are as good as any team in the country. It is a great time to be finding your stride, huh? You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome to the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to bring you daily reports through another season of Gonzaga Hoops. Today's episode of Locked On Zags is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook partner of the Locked On Podcast Network. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. Well, that is was an extremely fun game of basketball on Thursday evening for anybody who missed it and the late 8 p.m. start here on the West Coast. It was a rematch against LMU, the team that beat Gonzaga earlier this year at the McCarthy Athletic Center. First time LMU had a win in Spokane since 1991. LMU, the only team to ever beat Gonzaga, St. Mary's, and BYU in the same season. There was some optimism for LMU fans that maybe they could do the unthinkable and sweep Gonzaga. Gonzaga has not lost two consecutive games to a conference opponent since 2015, and that can streak continues. Gonzaga absolutely stomped all over LMU. It was 5-4 to four at one point. If you blinked, it was 20-4, to four, and at that point, it didn't even get remotely closer than that. The Zags had a 40, count it, 40-point 40 lead at halftime, at halftime. 68 to 28 at halftime. In case you weren't sure, Gonzaga's last time these two teams played when they lost 67 points total. They dropped that and more in the first half with Chet Holmgren in the building, watching his old friends go out and absolutely dominate an LMU team that is good. They just did not have it in this game. Gonzaga had an outstanding game plan, a huge part of that game plan was to let somebody other than Drew Timmy do a lot of the work. And boy, howdy, did it work. What a fantastic performance from this team. Drew Timmy had one point at halftime. Again, again, to reiterate, everybody on Gonzaga's team not named Drew Timmy combined in the first half to score the same number of points that this entire team scored in an entire game against this team last time. 67 points scored by Gonzaga's non-Drew Timmy players in the first half. The largest, this game ended up being the largest Division I road win against a team who had already beat this team earlier in the season. Ever, ever, since they've been tracking this data, this is the biggest road win a team has ever secured over a team that already beat them this year. A monster performance from Gonzaga and a message to the rest of the NCAA. This team is not dead in the water. The Zags are not past their prime. Their window has not closed Things are not done in Spokane. Mark Few's not, you know, closing the door behind him. This team is ready. They are here. They are prepared to compete with anybody in the country. And yes, I know that LMU is not, even though they are having a very good year, I do not mean to discredit LMU. I understand that they're not the level of competition that the, the Zags are going to face in the NCAA tournament, but they play like this. They do this. Julian Strother does this. We're going to be talking about this team making a potentially deep run in March. We're going to talk more about Julian Strother and his performance in this game in the second segment. I wanted to focus a little bit more on Drew Timmy. He had he had one point at halftime, like we said. He finished with 13-6 and six on three of five shooting. That was pretty much it. Last time these two teams played, Rick Asanza had a really nice game, three blocks against Drew Timmy down on the block. And what happened is Gonzaga was so reliant on getting Drew the ball and letting him operate that when a team finally found the ability to shut him down, they didn't know what to do. They made sure to come into this game without that being an issue. Again, we'll talk about Strother a little bit more later. He had 30 points on six of eight shooting from deep. Some of them were well past NBA range. We're talking Damian, Dalla, Lillard range for Strother on a few of these shots. Uh, but the Zags have five total players in double figures. Watson had 16 points on an incredibly efficient seven of nine shooting. Malachi Smith came off the bench to drop 13 on 6 of 10 shooting. Rasir Bolton had 12 points on another super efficient 6 of 9 shooting in only 22 minutes. 
That's a nice key here as well. Drew Timmy played 19 minutes. Rasir Bolton played 22 minutes. When you don't need to ride your guys too much when there's a game two days later, it's very, very nice to not have to do that. Nolan Hickman finished with nine points, had a couple really, really nice passes, really nice uh, drives around. He kind of had some Steve Nash things going. For those of you who remember watching Steve Nash, uh, driving around the baseline, getting underneath the basket and really being able to create from that spot because the defense kind of has a hard time figuring out whether you're going to try to go up for a shot, whether you're going to make another pass to somebody down on the block. Uh, Hickman exploited that opportunity and got a few good looks around the rim as well as a few nice passes out of there as well. One of the only kind of bad things that happened in this game, and I don't have a, a full update for you right now, unfortunately, but again, for those who, who watched through the second half of this game, you saw towards the end of the game a frustration foul committed by a player for LMU that knocked Efton Reed to the ground pretty hard, and the player was immediately assessed a flagrant foul, which was the correct call. It was a, it was a, a dumb, bad foul that you, you just can't do that. You can't do that. You're going to get somebody hurt. And in this case, it looked like that may have been what happened. Efton Reed got up pretty gingerly. He was holding his back. He was holding his leg. It was a little hard to tell on the broadcast exactly where he was hurting, but he was he wasn't moving too good. And that's something to keep a really close eye on for the Zags. Obviously, Efton is not somebody who's playing big minutes on a night-to-night basis, but he is an integral part of what this team does, and they're going to need him in March. You need that depth. You need to have somebody like that who can come in and give you good minutes if a Drew Timmy gets in foul trouble, if an Anton Watson gets in foul trouble, if there's some ineffectiveness by some of those guys and you just need a big body dude to go in there. Maybe you need Efton to go in there and commit a few fouls. Like that's that's a legitimate strategy that teams could use. And Efton coming in and and you know banging around with some guys for a little bit is something I could see absolutely happening in the NCAA tournament. I think he's capable of playing at that level i don't you know he's capable of of being somebody who contributes to this team in march and they really need him and so as soon as we hear an update on this obviously i'll let people know uh hopefully it's it's minor and he's just bruised and banged up a little bit maybe they they don't play him on saturday against pepperdine they hopefully will not need to play him there if he is not at 100 percent health so that's something to kind of keep an eye on and then, and then, yeah, like I mentioned, the Zags getting to rest starters was huge in this game. Colby Brooks and Abe Eagle got in on the action. The two walk-ons for the Zags. Colby Brooks had one of the prettiest moves I have seen from anybody on Gonzaga's team this season. A Euro step down on an in transition where he's managed to just stop on a dime, plant his right foot, glide through the air around the basket, and finish with his left hand. It was perfection if you haven't seen this highlight go check it out you'd be shocked to find out that colby brooks is a walk-on on this team he looked really smooth in that play uh abe eagle had an incredible backdoor pass to malachi smith just everybody was getting in on the action about the only guy we didn't see in this game was dominic harris and i received a lot of questions on twitter i received emails about this people wondering what was going on with dom here to dispel anything that people might be worried about dom was sick this has been confirmed by Theo Lawson of the Spokesman Review, who tweeted it out before the game, who tweeted it out as confirmation after the game. It's also confirmed by Sean Harris, Dominic's father, on Twitter on Friday morning, who said Dom is sick. So there's, there, this is not a story right now. I, I know people were concerned. Is he looking to transfer? Is he not traveling with the team anymore? Is there some frustration, et cetera, et cetera? No. That's not the case right now. Dom is sick. He did not travel with the team. That is all that we know. If when we find out more about that, uh, I'll let you know, but we may not find out anything more about that. If he's sick, he's sick. He's just not traveling with the team. It's a bummer because he would have gotten a a legitimate amount of run in this game as much as potentially eight to 10 minutes that he might've been able to play. We got a chance to see Dom against one of the better teams that we've gotten to see him play against, but unfortunately that was not able to come together for him in this game. Hopefully he gets healthy soon and we'll get to see him in the Chicago state game potentially, or at least the WCC tournament. uh, If he does not come back uh, for that final week of the regular season. Last note here before we move on, uh, St. Mary's did win. <laughs> they were up about 20 against San Diego uh, and ultimately nearly blew that one. San Diego came all the way back and made it a three-point game. Zags gained ground in Ken Palm, uh, but they do not gain ground in the actual standing. Still one game back heading into that game next Saturday on the 25th against the Gales. It's going to be a really, really fun one. Well, the big story for Gonzaga these past few games has been the play of Julian Strother. If he keeps this up, Not only will this team make a deep run in the NCAA tournament, but he's going to be an easy first round pick. We're going to get to that more soon, but today's, before we get there, today's episode of Locked on Zags is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. The midway point of the NBA season is here, and now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. 
because new customers get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on anything from the money line to point scores to threes drained. Maybe you like DeMontis Sabonis to keep putting up huge numbers. Maybe you like Zach Collins in his new role with the Spurs to keep up the high level of production. Maybe you want to make an exclusive bet like Corey Kispert hitting two threes in the first three minutes of Washington's next game. Plus, FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with a same game parlay. So don't miss the chance to get your no sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook betting partner of the NBA. All right, segment two, still any patents, still Locked On Zags. Want to thank all of you for making Locked On Zags your first listen of the day for your second listen today. Check out the Locked On College Basketball Podcast. It's fantastic content with experts, insiders, other Locked On hosts talking all things college hoops five times per week. Locked On College Basketball is available on YouTube and wherever you get podcasts. All right, we're talking Julian Strother here in the second segment. A monstrous performance from him against LMU on Thursday evening. Really, I want to talk about his performance, and I also want to talk about what Gonzaga's offense looked like in this game. I thought this was an incredible adjustment by Mark Few. What happened in the first game against LMU, and we kind of already touched on this a little bit in the first segment, but Gonzaga got overly reliant on Drew Timmy. This has been an issue for this team this year in a lot of ways, and it's kind of a chicken and the egg conversation. And I understand both arguments. Some people will say, well, the Zags being so reliant on Drew Timmy is causing potentially timidness from the other players. They don't necessarily know their role or know what to do. And so giving the ball to Drew too much is bad. The flip side of that, and Michigan State is a prominent example of this, of a game where Gonzaga attempted to do other things. When they realized it was not working, they started just getting, they were like, let's get get Drew the ball. Sometimes Drew got the ball before he even crossed half court, and they pretty much just let him start going to work from there. This happened in the Texas game as well, when Gonzaga's guards were feeling so much pressure from the opposing guards that they just gave Drew Timmy the basketball as soon as they possibly could and let him go to work. So in some cases, people will say, well, you just need to get Drew the ball because nobody else could step up. And in some cases, people will say, well, Drew Timmy getting the ball so much is why those other players are not stepping up. Again, it's a chicken and the egg conversation. That is what bit Gonzaga in the butt against LMU last time. LMU was playing a lot of single coverage. The Zags thought we can just get Drew Timmy the ball, let him go to work. And Drew struggled. It happens. (laughs) Players are allowed to have bad games. I thought that LMU's game plan against Drew Timmy was very solid. Rick Asanza played a really, really good game. Michael Graham played a really, really good game. Both those guys had three blocks in that game for LMU. But in this game, you could tell Gonzaga was not was ready to do something different. The ball was moving around much more. It was flying around the perimeter. Players were moving more. And Drew, he was involved because he's always involved. Because even if he's not touching the ball that much, again, he only had five shot attempts in this game. But even if he's not getting as many touches, him constantly moving around the block, getting position, fighting for position, that is where LMU's defensive focus is. So they're worried about what Drew's doing. Understandably, he's a national player of the year candidate, and everybody else on Gonzaga's team is moving, cutting, flashing, doing all of that stuff, and they're getting open looks. And then Julian Strother just couldn't miss in this game. Five threes in the first half, six total threes for him in this one. Like we said, 30 points. He was hitting from everywhere. He's pulling up one foot behind the line, two feet behind the line, four feet behind the three-point line. He's getting fouled on three-point attempts. And part of why that's happening, Gonzaga got a ton of and-one attempts in this game. Three-point attempt and-ones, cuts to the basket where they got fouled and-one. Part of that is because they were just a step quicker than LMU in every facet of this game. You would hope they would be. They have a more talented roster. They have more talented athletes on their team. But this game, they exploited that. They went out and got open looks because they were moving, because they were cutting, because they were faster and quicker and more decisive than LMU's defense. They they had to play reactionary. They could not impose what they wanted to do on the defensive end of the floor. That's what happened in the first game. Gonzaga was playing right into LMU's defensive strategy. In this game, they completely flipped the script. Julian Strother monster game for him and really it's been a monster few weeks for him we've talked so much on this podcast about how critical it is for Gonzaga to have a secondary scorer step up and show some consistency Julian's still not quite there but over the last six games he has scored 25 or more points in three of them 
three of the last six games, he has scored 25 or more points. Now, one of those games, he had eight. One of those games, he had 10. One of those games, he had 12. So again, we're still, he's not quite steadily in that 15 point per game range. But when you get 25 in three or more games, one of them was 40. One of them was 30. The other one was 26. Over the last six games, Strother's averaging 20.7 points, four and a half rebounds. He's shooting 51% from deep and 58% from the field on, or excuse me, from two pointers on the field. So he's about 60% from inside the arc, about 50% from outside the arc, uh, 20 points per game, four and a half boards. Obviously the 51% from three is probably not going to maintain for the rest of the season. I suppose that it could. I think that's a little unlikely. He's more of a 40, 42% three-point shooter, but for a six-game stretch to just get nuclear hot and shoot 50 50 plus percent is not surprising, but it's more that he's making really good decisions with the basketball. He's not showing timidness. He's not passing up good looks to try to get Drew Timmy the basketball. He's playing within the flow of the offense. Whether that was a conscious decision by the coaching staff to encourage more of that type of behavior, whether Julian took matters into his own hands and said, look, I can score on these guys. I'm just going to do it. I don't know what exactly the situation is, but it is clear since that Portland game that Strother has been given more autonomy, more of a green light to go get buckets. Him scoring 26 against BYU was really, really critical. They needed it. They needed him to step up down the stretch and put put the ball in the hoop, and he did it. In this game, he helped bury LMU immediately with a really, really strong performance. I talked about Julian Strother and how this would impact his NBA draft as well, and that's kind of what I want to talk about here. Julian Strother has continued to maintain a spot in the second round of most mock drafts. We are in mid-February right now. The draft is in June, so there is a lot of time for these things to change. A lot of time. However, Julian has kind of He was a a late first type guy before the season started, maybe late early second round, kind of where Andrew Nembhard went last year when he went 31st in the Indiana Pacers. He has kind of dropped since then, and you can see why his performance was less consistent this year. Uh, He wasn't as much of a scorer as I think people expected him to be. But now we're starting to see that tick up again. And for NBA scouts or GMs or player, whoever, if they're watching that Gonzaga LMU game, they see where he's shooting the basketball from. They see how he's using his size to get to the free throw line, even on three point attempts, how quickly he's pulling the trigger on those shots, his ability to get into the rim and his defensive intensity. If they're watching those videos, it's hard for me to not think, yeah, maybe I'll take a flyer on him in the late first. You know, if I'm a contending team picking towards the end of the first round, as most contending teams tend to do, And I'm looking at this kid who's a junior who's already played three years of college basketball and thinking, hey, he can help me now. We could draft this guy in the late first round. We could put him on our bench. He'd be our ninth guy right away. He's a three and D wing. I mean, he's the he's the prototype for this type of player that the NBA highly covets. Three and D wings. It's 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 all the rage. It's all the rage in the NBA right now. You want a guy who's between like six six and six nine, who can shoot threes, just on a standstill shoot threes, catch and shoot. That's a huge part of it for Strother. Very very good at that. Who can create their own threes if necessary, and who can play above average defense on the other side of the floor. Julian Strother can do all of that. He can do all of that. He probably doesn't have as high of upside as a lot of the like freshmen that are going in that round in that range on many mock drafts right now. Guys like Kalel Ware at Oregon, Kyle Filipowski at Duke. Uh, I mean, those guys are different positions, but they're the kind of players that, oh, that's some upside right there. Dariq Whitehead also at Duke. Like there's a handful of them. Bryce Sensabaugh at Ohio State. But Strother, yeah, he's a little bit older. And I know NBA scouts are really terrified of age. That's something that is that that drives down the, the price and value of players too much in the NBA. And, and Andrew Nembhard is a, is a prime example of that right now. Uh, same with Brandon Clark for that matter. Um, but Strother, he's, it's not like he's old. He's not, he's not like 23 or anything like that. I think he's 21. He might still be 20. I'm not even sure. Uh, regardless, Strother is, he's still young. He's got, he's got the skills that are coveted in the modern NBA. So to me, I don't know how if, if you're I know there's a lot of talented high upside players that are going to be available in like the, the 20s and the 30s. But the team's picking right there. They may not want a 19 year old who's three years away from competing. They may want a guy who's going to help their team right now. If I'm in the late first round and I'm, I'm trying to win a championship the next season, I don't think I want a 19 year old kid on, who was on a bad Duke team this past year. 
I think I want the 21 year old guy who, especially if he continues to play like this has proven, Hey, I have the skills to be an NBA player right now. I can be that guy that you want me to be. To me, that makes the most sense. I think Julian's when we get into the NBA draft season, when we're actually in the combine and we're doing all that stuff and he's doing all the testing and showing out like that. I think that'll help his draft stock kind of continue to boost up. I have maintained that. I don't think he is coming back next year, although that is still an option for him and it's it's far from a guarantee that he's not coming back but more performances like this more tape like this that nba scouts and general managers can watch and a, a solid performance in the ncaa tournament and bam i think you're looking at julian strother as being the next gonzaga player selected in the first round of the nba draft all right closing out the show looking ahead to saturday's game against the lowly but very talented pepperdine waves and what the zags to do need to do to secure another victory right after this all right, segment three, still any patents, still locked on Zags, and we're moving away from the LMU game, moving away from Julian Strother's epic performance in that one to talk about the Waves, the first opponent Gonzaga played in the WCC this season. So if people are like, I don't even remember this Pepperdine team, that's understandable. The game was uh, six weeks ago or so for the Zags. Uh, Gonzaga won handily in that game. Pepperdine has been one of the worst teams, in the, the worst team in the WCC. Lorenzo Romar continues to be Lorenzo Romar in the sense of having highly talented players, players that are, he's, he's out recruiting his coverage, if that makes sense. Uh, he's recruiting more talented players than typically come to a school like Pepperdine, but they're not winning. This is more or less exactly what he did at the University of Washington. It's a little surprising to me to continue to see him get these opportunities because it's kind of accepting that your team's not going to win as many games as they should. And I feel like that's the last thing that you want to accept as a coach or general manager or athletic director in this case. But hey, you know what? I'm not the one making those decisions. Romar is a, by all accounts, a good dude, a good human, uh, a coach that players respect and like playing for. So I'm not trying to discredit him too much there, but you kind of got to expect that you're not going to win very many games. And I, if maybe that's what, maybe they're okay with that, but this season has been pretty darn rough considering the amount of talent that is on this team. Regardless, let's take a look at the five keys. I think the Zags need to do in order to secure a victory on Saturday evening. Number one, we talked about it a ton already in the first segment, but move the ball fluidly and also don't be afraid to let Drew cook because I spent this whole first part of this podcast talking about Gonzaga's offense is better when they're more fluid, when they move the ball more, when they're not just overly reliant on getting Drew Timmy the basketball. Here's the deal, though. The last time these two teams played, Drew Timmy had 35 points on 15 of 19 shooting. Sometimes letting Drew Cook works. In fact, most of the time it works. If it didn't work most of the time, Drew Timmy wouldn't have like a 90 plus percent winning percentage as a member of the Gonzaga Bulldogs. So in this game, I think you still want to not become too dependent on just throwing the ball in the post and letting Drew Timmy go to work. But Pepperdine doesn't have a lot of horses to defend him. They don't really have that talent on the roster right now. So I think it's kind of fine to let Drew Timmy go to work when he gets positioned, when he's open, give him the ball. If they double, kick it out. He's been, he's been passing the ball better than he ever has at any point in his career this year. So you can rely on that. You can give him the ball, find an open spot on the perimeter. If your guy comes to double, he's going to find you. You're going to get an open look. I think the Zags are better when they aren't so one-dimensional, but I also think Drew Timmy can absolutely dominate this game. So it'll be an interesting thing to see whether they kind of go back to being a little bit more one-dimensional offensively or if they kind of try to spread the ball a little bit more. Either way, I think they have a, a good shot here against a pretty bad defensive team in Pepperdine, but it'll be interesting to see whether they revert back or, or how they kind of proceed with their offense going forward. Second key here, uh, go at Maxwell Lewis on defense. For those of you who, who maybe don't remember the last game or haven't paid a ton of attention to WCC hoops this year, Maxwell Lewis is the best NBA prospect in the WCC. He is higher on almost every single mock draft than Julian Strother. He is typically in the 20 to 30 range. I have seen him higher than 20. I have seen him in the teens. I'm not sure if I've ever quite seen him all the way up into the lottery, but he's similar to Strother. He's a six, seven wing. Uh, he's a high level scorer. He's more of a creator than just a standstill shooter. And I think that that's what NBA scouts are really kind of appealed to by Lewis. But here's the thing. He's a bad defensive player, like not just below average. He's bad. He's not good on that end of the floor. And it's a huge issue for Pepperdine. It's a huge issue for his draft stock. It's a huge issue for the team in general. Last time these two teams played, Julian Strother quickly got Maxwell Lewis in foul trouble, center of the bench, and the Zags just ran away with it from there. Let's do that again. 
<laughs> Why not, right? It seemed to work last time. Strother is on an absolute heater right now. He has proven he is very, very difficult to defend. Uh, if I'm the Zags, get Strother the ball. Let him exploit that mismatch. If Lewis stays in front of him, Julian's probably going to draw contact and get him get him in foul trouble. If Julian or if Lewis does not stay in front of him, Julian's got free reign to the basket. He's going to score. He's going to put the ball in the hoop. Uh, I think this is a really really nice matchup for the Zags. Even if Lewis is one of the most appealing players in the conference, is averaging over 17 points a game. I think Strother has a mismatch here in terms of Lewis's in a struggles defensively, and I think the Zags would be smart to really really exploit that early in this game. Next key for the Zags, pressure defense on the guards. Pepperdine's super turnover prone. They had 17 the last time these two teams played each other. They also don't have really a lot of post presence. So for Gonzaga, I think it's a good idea to just put a lot of pressure on the guards. Get up in their grill. Houston Millette, very, very talented young player. He's a sophomore. He's a team leader. Really, really good player. Maxwell Lewis, we already kind of talked about him. He's fantastic as well. He's 6'7", six, 6'8", six, so he's he's not really a post player for them. He's just a big wing that they have on their team. Mike Mitchell Jr. is their other guard. He's a very, very good passer as well. And But they, they're, the presence down low is not really there. So I think for Gonzaga, pressure the guards, get Anton Watson out on the perimeter, get Hunter Salas out on the perimeter, force those guys to make mistakes, force those guys to make turnovers because – if they have to, if they do get past Gonzaga's guards, yes, Gonzaga doesn't have a ton of rim protection. You got Drew Timmy down there, you know, using his body, putting his hands up, but there's not a lot of other players who are going to kill you down there. So I think I'd rather put pressure on those guards, make them turn the basketball over, see if you can get out in transition, which is key number four. Try to play in transition. We've talked about this a ton this year. Many, many games, one of the keys has been play in transition, and it's rarely happening. Gonzaga is struggling to get out in transition this year. Part of it is not having the dynamic outlet passers and guaranteed rebound suckers like Chet Holmgren. Part of it is not having a point guard like Andrew Nemhard, whose ability to get out in transition and make throw ahead passes is just second to none, uh, quite honestly, in terms of Gonzaga point guards in history. But in this game, Pepperdine is 10th in the country in tempo. 10th in the country in tempo per Ken Palm. They're going to get out and run. They're going to go. Teams that try to run with Gonzaga usually fail. It doesn't work very well. If Pepperdine attempts to do that here in this game, I think it's going to become a boat race. And this is what we saw last time. Gonzaga scored over 110 points, uh, and Pepperdine scored 88. It's probably going to look similar to that. It's going to be a fast-paced, short possessions, go, go, go type of game. I think that favors the Zags, and I think that they should – I think it's smart that they got rest on Thursday – that Drew Timmy played 19 minutes, that Rasir Bolton played 22 minutes. Those guys are going to be more rested, going to be more ready to go, get out in transition, make beat this team at their own game. Because I think that Gonzaga has the athletes, they have the horses, they have the talent to outrun Pepperdine, even if they are one of the fastest teams in the country. And finally, my last key for the game here in this one, let's have a big Ben Gregg game. Efton Reed may not play. Again, I'm not trying to break any information here. I don't know the specifics on his injury. It's probably going to be a game time decision, so we probably won't know until right before the game against Pepperdine. If Efton Reed does not play, if Gonzaga gets out to an early lead uh, and Drew Timmy gets some rest in the second half, we could see a lot of Ben Gregg. He might play 20, 23, 25 minutes in this game. Maybe not, but maybe so. And I, we haven't seen a huge Ben Gregg game in a while. He has continued to be a high-energy, great offensive rebounder. He's continued to be that player. Statistically, he's been a little quiet. In his last eight games, he's averaging under four points, under three rebounds per game. Just hasn't really had that. I don't think he scored in double figures in about a month. I think this is a good game for him to do that. Come in, stretch the floor, force Pepperdine to guard a player that's different than any other player on Gonzaga's roster as a 6'10 guy who can shoot. Uh, because Efton may not play in this game, he might get some extra rest. I think it gives the Zags an opportunity to, to let Ben cook, in a sense, and really play significant minutes, uh, get him more involved in the offense. He's going to be a big part of what this team does going forward. And while I don't want to look ahead of this game, certainly, if Gonzaga's up in the second half by 15 or 20 points, let's get Ben involved. Give Drew some rest. Give Anton some rest. Don't play Efton if he's not 100%. So let Ben do his thing. Let him prove why he deserves a significant role uh, as a Zag next season. All right, that is going to do it for day and for this week. Plenty more fantastic content coming your way later this week. We are going to do mailbag. It's going to come out late 
on Monday as I'm going to be out of town. But if you have questions, please submit them ahead of time. I'll get them into that show. You can find the podcast wherever you get podcasts. Go leave a review on iTunes. Leave a comment on YouTube. Subscribe on YouTube if you haven't done so yet. Also subscribe to the Locked On College Basketball Podcast. As of this writing, we are three subscribers short of 500. So please go hit that subscribe button there if you haven't done so yet. Thank you all for listening. Have a fantastic weekend and go Zags.